is uh, I'm going to talk mainly about this second paper here uh, with dissipation, um, but first paper will come up a little bit. And this is joint work with um, David Ambrose, uh, Pavel Lushnik, <laughs> and it's uh, Silent. Yeah. So, um, so I'm going to talk about the uh, generalized Constantine Lax Mida equation. And that is a simple 1D model for singularity formation in the 3D Euler equations. And there are lots of simple 1D models for singularity formation in the 3D Euler equations. I would, so this was the first, and I would argue the most influential, and I'll say why in a second. So I think you guys know this, but the 3D Euler singularity problem asks whether the incompressible Euler equations can develop a finite time singularity from smooth initial data of finite energy. And by smooth, we mean C infinity, usually. Uh, it is considered one of the most outstanding open problems in math and fluid dynamics. It has important ramifications in turbulence, and especially in the zero viscosity uh, energy dissipation in the zero viscosity limit of Navier-Stokes. It has been actively pursued for decades. And Funny enough, we, uh, we, we recently have a resolution or a, so a solution to the problem, a proof of blow up um, a few months ago by Tom Howe and Jia Ji Chen, and, but for a special case. Okay. So, um, so Jia Ji Chen and Tom Howe uh, uh, recently proved breakdown of C infinity solutions to 3D Euler and a very closely related uh, 2D Buzanesque equation. Um, on bounded domains, and these are inspired by two things. One is uh, computations of Luo and Hao, uh, but the second was methods developed for the GCLM equation, the equation I'm going to talk about. So, um, so their their singularity is an axisymmetric flow with swirl, which is the simplest geometry that you cannot rule out singularity formation. And uh, so here it is. Um, Dwight Barclay likes to call this uh, the teacup singularity because the primary flow is just stirring your tea. Okay, and there's a reflect, an odd reflection of that flow here. And, and what happens is if you just analyze the pressures in the problem, uh, you find that uh, a secondary flow is generated and that drives radial vorticity, uh, <clears throat> build up a radial vorticity at uh, what's called the critical ring, the, the, the symmetry plane there. Um, and the boundary is essential for this, by the way. So uh, that feeds back on itself and causes the vorticity to rapidly grow and, and, and they prove uh, blows up. Okay. So like I said, this proof is based on methods. It's directly uses methods developed for the GCLM equation. So that's why I would argue this has been influential. And more than that, um, Algindi also has an important result that smooth but not as smooth solutions break down of 3D Euler break down, become less smooth. And he developed that from the same techniques used by Algindi and Zhang for the GCLM equation. <clears throat> um, earlier, Chen Hao and De Huang uh, showed that C infinity solutions of GCLM on the real line uh, break down in finite time for some special cases. And in their paper on the 3D Euler singularity proof, they say they follow the general strategy established in that equation. So I would argue that this equation is a sandbox or a proving ground for the development of techniques. And it's the story doesn't end, I think. Uh, there's still open, interesting open questions for the 3D Euler equations. Can singularities occlude, uh, occur in a periodic or an unbounded geometry? That's still open. And in the GCLM equation, we can ask how does singularity formation depend on geometry? namely real line versus periodic. And what is the effect of dissipation? And I'm gonna have some other questions, um, some still open as we go along. Okay, so what are these equations? I'm gonna talk about that in the next few slides. So the starting point is the uh, vorticity stream formulation of uh, Euler, which we've seen before. Uh, so this is completely equivalent to the native formulation. And so we write the, um, momentum equation in terms of the vorticity. And then you need, you need an equation to determine the velocity from the vorticity. And that's uh, called the Biot-Savart law. Uh, 
And so you can, uh, I think many of you know this, you can write the Beal Savar law using a Green's function formulation. There's an equivalent formulation, and that's here. Okay. So a very important term is the vortex stretching. I don't think this is working. The vortex stretching term, which is the last term up there, because that's required for the nonlinear amplification of vorticity. In 2D, that term is absent, just from uh, 2D that's absent, and you just have invection of vorticity along particle paths, and you can prove that there is no singularities. That's perfectly smooth. So the vortex stretching is required for singularities. Now, if you just sort of, if you take informally take a gradient of this, and I'm gonna call that S, that is a matrix of singular integrals. And formally, S times omega, which is the vortex stretching term goes like omega squared. And so, you know, D by DT of um, D omega DT equals omega squared blows up. But the problem is harder than that because this is a matrix. And analysis of the regularity is complicated by, well, it's also non-local. So the non-local and the matrix structure, I mean, you need, Locally, you would need the, vor the vorticity to line up in, uh, in the direction of an, you know, an eigenfunction associated with an unstable eigenvalue. And that's hard to analyze. So that's why we come up with simpler 1D model equation. And so here's how you get to the GCLM equation. It's pretty easy. You replace u dot grad u with the 1D version of it. And I've kind of added a, an A there. A is just a parameter. <laughs> And I'll motivate that in a second. It controls the relative strength of advection paired to vortex stretching. And then I replace, okay, so this is the vortex stretching term here. I replace that with H omega. H is where H is the Hilbert transform, ex exactly what we saw in John Hunter's slides. Okay. Why do we do that? Well, uh, H, the Hilbert transform is the unique linear 1D singular integral operator that preserves the most important properties of S. Uh, there's, a, there's several of them, but I'll mention um, um, it commutes with translations, it commutes with dilations, and there, there are other things. There's good reason to do that. In addition, this preserves the quadratic nonlinearity of our original term. And finally, we have to recover the velocity from the vorticity. And in the 3D Euler, that comes from you know, this equation. I'm going to replace that with its 1D analog with the H instead of the S. Oh, I forgot to say. So the reason why we, we put a A on the advection term is we want to study the effect of advection on suppressing singularities. And that's been a hot topic lately. It started with uh, work on the Keller Siegel model of chemotaxis, you could show that you can show that um, advection can suppress singularities. It's interesting. Mixing. So we're studying that here too. So the final model is here. Um, and a little history, Constein, Lax, and Maida, they started the equation with A equals zero. So this is gone and no dissipation. I've added a dissipation term. I'll talk about that. That's Constein, Lax, Maida. Uh, De Gregorio added an invection term, but without the A. And Okamoto added the invection term with the A. And that gives a lot of rich dynamics. We added this dissipation term here. And we're going to consider this equation both on the real line and, the, and in the periodic box. And a main point of the talk is what is the difference of doing that? Okay. So this is a generalized dissipation term. Here's the Fourier symbol. So when sigma equals two, this is just standard, you know, second derivative dissipation, but we have, we're allowing for other stuff. Okay. There's lots of results on this equation. A lot of very well-known analysts have worked on it, but just to basically summarize, there's the only results are for certain values of A. So for A, some negative values, things are known, A equals zero, one half and one. Those are the values of A, which things are known. We're going to present results for a wide range of A and different signals. And I'm particularly going to focus on the problem with dissipation. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to investigate blow up versus global existence using, first of all, direct new macro simulations and tracking of complex singularities, which is something that was first done, I think, for interface problems and is widely done for interface problems. 
we're going to present, we've developed lots of exact analytical solutions for the problem for some A's and sigmas. And, that, and in the last few slides, some rigorous analysis. Okay, so I'm going to start with just giving you an overview from numerics. What do you see? So we use a spectral, so we're, we're doing a periodic problem and a problem on the real line. For the periodic problem, we use a very accurate spectral method, eighth order, Runge-Kutta, and time. Adaptive in time, we put as many space points as we need to resolve the spectrum. Uh, it's a little bit more of a challenge to compute in the periodic problem. I mean, sorry, in the real line problem. And we do something there that I think is very nice. We, we map the infinite domain to the periodic box. And something very interesting happens there, which is nice for numerics. So here's the mapped problem. You have to transform your Hilbert transform. Well, the, the Hilbert transform on the infinite line then transforms to the periodic Hilbert transform. And that's nice. Periodic, so you can just evaluate this with FFTs, plus a constant term. That's also easy to evaluate. So now the real line problem is as easy to do as the periodic problem. Uh, so as part of our numerics, we track complex singularities. Uh, so, um, so one reason to do this is it's, it's kind of hard to tell if something blows up in finite time or infinite time. And it's hard to characterize singularities. And so we use the um, asymptotics, the asymptotic decay of the Fourier spectrum to do that is one way to do that. So for example, if your function has a, sing a complex singularity at distance delta from the real line with power determined by P, then it's uh, Fourier coefficients decay exponentially with delta. So delta is the distance from the complex plane and P tells you the power. And when delta reaches zero, then the singularity occurs in your solution. So we also use something called the AAA algorithm, but I'm not by, uh, which is due to Trafethen and collaborators, which gives you complementary information, but I won't talk too much about that. Okay, so this is a summary of the numerical results here. So first of all, in both the dissipative and the non-dissipative problem, we find uh, similarity, blow, similarity solutions that blow up. And they're of this form here with similarity exponents, beta and alpha. Okay. So, um, so we find solutions where alpha is greater than zero, which corresponds to self-similar collapse. That's where the support. So, and I should say we find similarity solutions, both exact similarity solutions and locally similar, local similarity solutions where the similar self-similar form is in a space-time neighborhood of the blow-up but also exact ones. And uh, we find different kinds of exponents. For it, we find alpha greater than zero exponents, which is self-similar collapse, where the support of the solution shrinks and it grows off to infinity, okay? And those are common. <laughs> but we also find solutions by varying our parameter A, where alpha is less than zero. And that means the self-similar solution expands off to infinity in finite time. The support expands off. Here's our finite <laughs> Right when we blow up. <laughs> I took a pretty long excellent timing. Blow up a solution. Yeah, excellent timing. All right. You got negative diffusion. You get that. <laughs> so these expanding solutions, they expand off to infinity. The support expands off to infinity in finite time. And they, they, the amplitude goes to infinity. And so these are common. I personally have never seen these before. I think they're less common. And, and I don't know if anybody can tell me if you've ever seen them in the same problem, whereas you vary parameter, it goes from one to the other. Okay. And we also find alpha equals zero solutions, which are neither collapsing or expanding. They, the support stays the same and they just blow up. Okay. So I should mention, uh, everyone knows this, the solution is universal. It's a fixed shape. When you rescale omega and X by time. And so by the universal fixed shape, I'm talking about this F here. Okay, so this is just an example of our numerics. So this is for A equals a half and sigma equals one. So with some dissipation here. Okay, you can see this is our rescaled solution. So this is meant to be plotting the F in time and you can see so this would be a local similarity solution it approaches it approaches the f here the black line in time and it, it's it's approaching a local self this is a local self similarity so self similar solution 
uh, we can read off, if this works, we can read off the power of the singularity from the decay of the Fourier spectrum. This is the Fourier spectrum. So P is minus one means that these are two double poles in the complex plane, which move toward the real line. Okay. So it's not too hard to relate the distance of the singularity from the complex plane, from the real line rather, delta, to the similarity exponent alpha. So you can get, you, this relation is, is a theoretical relation. And then you can use a fit so alpha would be the slope of a plot of delta versus tc minus t in, the, in a log-log plot. It would be the slope. And so you can fit to that slope using your alpha determined from the decay of the Fourier spectrum. And we get alpha is very close to a third, up to the fourth digit there. And similarly, we can fit for beta on a log-log plot of maximum of the omega. And we get beta is one. So this is a a one-third one similarity exponents. And it turns out we have an analytical prediction of that. So I'll get to that. So this is a summary of our results. Um, so, um, so on both the real line and the periodic domain, we find well, this is this is versus A. A. We find that there's um, self-similar collapse where the red red mark is, and then that transitions to expanding self-similar blow up on the real line in this region, or if you're on the periodic domain, this would be neither expanding nor collapsing self-similar blow up because you can't expand forever when you're on the periodic domain. And then up here, greater than one, we find um, global existence, no, numerically, suggestive of global existence. So there's some interesting points and features here I want to point out. One is when sigma's two, when you have the biggest dissipation that we tried, this changes from collapse to global existence. But only at sigma equals two. Below that, it's still collapse. This is a special point. Uh, in the periodic problem, this problem belongs in the blue region, globally stable. In the real line problem, it belongs in the green region expanding blow up. So difference between periodic and real. This little blue bubble here means our numerical evidence for global existence isn't as good as it is here, but we think it's global existence. Um, and finally, and I think the most interesting thing is we find a critical value where you change from collapse to expanding blow up. And we can compute that critical value to 14 digits. We have no theoretical explanation of why yet. So I was going to say here that there's no theory for most of this A. However, two days ago, like in the middle, literally in the middle of this conference, hmm. I got a preprint from Duhuang et al. with Tom Howe's former student who's now at Beijing University, who says he can prove that there exists self-similar blow up in the non-dissipative problem or A less than one, the whole range. And he was able to say that you trans you go from collapsing blow up so you, you on the left of that you have collapsing blow up on the right of that you have expanding blow up, but he can't say anything about it in between. So it kind of brackets our number. Okay, all right, that gives you uh, some idea. But I, my main goal in this talk is a little bit different. It's to illustrate a contrast between well posedness and singularity formation on the real line and the periodic domain when you have dissipation. And I'm going to begin by presenting some exact analytical solutions. We, um, we, we've been able to find, I, I counted recently, it's been exact analytical solutions for eight different sets of parameters. And um, these are fun to find, and we're, we, we still find them every week. We keep looking. Um, so I'll say a little bit about that. OK. So the exact analytical solutions, by the way, are by a method called pole dynamics. And so here's an example of one of the simplest ones. So we, this is uh, for sigma equals one diffusion, so some diffusion, some dissipation. So um, you look for a solution um, as, a, as a sum of poles, some in the upper half plane, some in the lower half plane. And that usually doesn't work. You can't always do it. It needs special parameters because you're, your collection of poles needs to close. 
So, um, so, so nonlinearities in the problem, nonlinearities in the problem will generate other poles and logs because we have to integrate something, right? To get the U. And so you need those to all cancel out. And these are long, it, the forms look very simple. So it looks like it's easy to do, but these are long calculations because you have something smooth multiplying, you know, this is smooth when you go to the, this is a lower half plane singularity. So it's smooth when you go to the upper half plane and it multiplies the singularity. So in any case, uh, when A is a half at sigma equals one, and, and so we look for solutions in terms of movable, these are movable poles and time dependent amplitudes. And when A equals one half and sigma is one, we can find them. And so you plug them into the equations and you equate like power poles and you get a system of ODEs then. And so this is the simplest one that, that we found, I think, one of the simplest. And so now you can analyze singularities in this. So here clearly there are two equilibrium points, zero and two. And if you look at it long enough, two is an unstable equilibrium and zero is a, is a stable equilibrium. And so, uh, so you can see, and here omega, by the way, is uh, just a redefined parameter, amplitude and singularity position here. This is a singularity position. And so what you see is there's self-similar blow up when this is bigger than two, basically. And, uh, and, uh, it's, it's, uh, and it doesn't blow up when it's less than two. And here I'm showing a computation when, it's, when omega is three, and you can see the amplitude blows up and the singularity goes to the real line. So that's, that's blow up. Uh, and so we could also, so we, it turns out this one, we could, we could actually integrate. Uh, we can integrate that um, and find an implicit solution, implicit form solution. And, uh, and that tells us that the self-similar form is given with alpha equals a third and beta equals one. And does that sound familiar? That's, uh, that, that was this. But here I didn't take the exact data, initial data of the exact self-similar solution. This was just other, some data and then approach that. Now, you would think because it only blows up for when omega is greater than two, that this won't blow up for small data. But if you compute the L2 norm of this solution, it looks like this. So you can, you can pick omega bigger than two at the initial time and the singularity far away, and the L2 norm will be small and you'll still get blow up. So this blows up for small data, even though I have dissipation, arbitrarily small data. Okay, here's another one. This one wasn't one of ours, but I really like it. <laughs> this is just, this is the this is the only other whole dynamic solution to the dissipative problem. The only the only other one. Uh, it's Chauchet's solution um, with sigma. So we've ramped up. I've ramped up the dissipation here. And so Shea writes his solution as a sum of single and double poles. I'm just giving the part in the this is the upper analytic part. So the part with poles in the lower half plane. There'll be some with there'll be a part with poles in the upper half plane completely symmetric. And so Chauche was able to get ex exact analytical expressions for the pole locations and the amplitudes. Okay, and he didn't do it, but you can write uh, a locally self-similar form of his solution in a time space neighborhood of blow up. And so his solution corresponds to alpha equals one and beta equals two. And here's a here's a plot of the uh, universal form of the similarity solution where the dots are, and you can see his solution approaches that. I think there's actually six curves on this plot. Now, funny enough, when, um, when we first started computing this, uh, we didn't get his, we, we used his initial data, we didn't get his solution. We didn't get, we got, uh, instead of these poles, we got branch points We when we looked at the complex plane. We weren't exactly, we didn't get exactly his, blow up time. It was really close, but not exactly. And that confused us for a long time. We realized we did the calculation independently. One number was wrong in this term. And when you fix that, you get exactly this. A typo in his paper? A typo or an error, but it was bad. I'll do this one quickly. This, so, so anyway, what you see, I should say his solution blows up also. It always blows up. Even though you have strong dissipation, it always blows up, and it does so for arbitrarily small data. And now you see the trend. This is for this is the problem on the real line. The problem on the real line, you get blow up for small data. 
here's a now this doesn't add to that i mean that's that's i could go on but i kind of just like the solution this is a solution for a equals zero and dissipation we find we look for one with two sets of poles they are the differential equations for them which are here are coupled so the dynamics of the poles affect each other and you can get them you can get it to pass through the real line with a negative imaginary velocity when it hits the real line, or you can get it to bounce off the real line with zero velocity when it hits the real line. And that gives you different self-similar forms. This is alpha equal beta equal one. This is alpha equal beta equal two. So very sensitive dependence on the initial data about which similarity solution you get. And, uh, and when we compute the initial value problem, not this exact solution, we put the data into our initial value problem solver and compute, we find we can see these, both of these, even though this one looks like it should be unstable. So the exact pole dynamic solutions all give self-similar blow up for arbitrarily small that I've presented and, and that we found all give uh, arbitrarily a uh, blow up for arbitrarily small data. That's for the problem on the real line. I haven't presented any exact solutions for the periodic problem. We have found those though, and I'll give one at the end. So a different result holds on the periodic domain. And so this kind of motivated David Ambrose and I <laughs> for uh, some to try to prove, we, actually we tried to prove uh, global existence to the problem for A equals one, which is a famous open problem, mainly because many well-known analysts have worked on it and it's still an open problem. And we couldn't get that either. But so, so we, we, we turned directions and what we wanted to do is look at what happens in the periodic domain. And so what we what we're able to do is prove by two complementary approaches that in the periodic domain, not the real domain, periodic domain, with enough dissipation as global and time solutions for small data. But what I like best, all A, it, it's, it's the whole the whole line, whole line in A. And so I just say the last few slides, I'll just say a little bit about that. So both approaches rely on starting with Duhamel's formulation to write the solution the solution in terms of this uh using this operator here f is just the fourier transform and so this operator takes care of the dissipative part you know in fourier space so in this representation we just need to get estimates on this then okay so one approach we used proves that when sigma is greater than or equal to one the solution exists globally in time for small data, I forgot to say, in a periodic Wiener algebra, which sounds really fancy, but just means that you can, the, you're, you're, it uses a norm, which is finite if the Fourier coefficients are summable. Okay. And then this proof shows that the solutions are analytic at, po at all positive times in a strip that contains the real line with width growing linearly in time. So the, the singularities have to be bounded away farther as you go up in time. So this uses a method of Duchamp and Robert, which was originally invented for, originally uh, 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 developed for the vortex sheet problem, Calvin Helmholtz problem, to show global existence for certain data, but it's also been adapted to parabolic. So that's an elliptic problem, the vortex sheet problem, but it's been adapted to the parabolic problem that we, like we have here. Okay, just a couple more slides. The second approach, proves global and time existence for messier initial data. So initial data in L2. So it could be rough, even rough data. But you lose a little bit here, only when sigma is greater than one, before it was greater than or equal to. And uh, the challenge here is to detect, to, so to do this proof, you need an estimate on the HS norm where S, uh, where S is bigger, in terms of an HR norm. So here, for example, if you take R equals zero, this just, this could just be the L2 norm of F. So you need a, uh, an estimate on a norm with more derivatives in terms of a norm with less derivatives, which is usually fraught with difficulty. But I can make use of dissipation here and do it, okay? But the problem is, is T tends to zero and dissipation doesn't have time to act. Something has to blow up here and you see that. You see this blowing up term, right? And we also need this estimate, the estimate to decay exponentially in time. 
And so we can get away with this as long as, because we, in the dual HML formulation, you have an integral over time. As long as you can in, the, integrate this, this is integrable. Okay, so that restricts the power here, which in turn restricts the sigma. That's what restricts the sigma. Okay, so the proof guarantees that a solution for T greater than zero exists. So I started with L2 data, exists in a space with more derivatives, the Sobolev space, H gamma, more derivatives for gamma in this. Okay, and this is hard to parse. So let me just do a little bit. Suppose sigma is one, so very near the boundary of what I can do, what I can Sigma is one, and this is a half, or, or sigma has to be bigger than one, so this is a little bit bigger than a half. So for gamma, roughly around a half, I, I, I go from data, I go from data in L2 to solution in H1 half, okay? If I increase sigma, gamma can get bigger. Okay, fine. Um, but you can keep going. You can take data in H1 hat. You go a little bit of time, and then you can take data in H1 half and go a little further. So we call that bootstrapping. It can be bootstrapped to give existence in C infinity. And then um, we haven't done the details, but we expect solutions, in fact, to be analytic, following an argument from uh, from this paper. Doesn't the min one part prevent gamma from increasing past one? Um, you're right, it sounds like that, but so maybe there's a typo here. Oh, 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 so no, but for the boot. Yeah, let me think about that. That's a good question. <laughs> so, um, yeah. So, um, so maybe a couple, one more slide or two more. So, um, so, uh, so this is consistent with numerics. We, we've done the numerics and we find for the you know, special two mode data, special two mode data. Um, we find no blow up for small data, blow up for large data. Uh, but also we see that even when sigma is, so the theory applies for sigma bigger than one or bigger than or equal to one, we, we see the same thing when sigma is smaller. So that kind of makes you ask the question, is there a critical sigma? Um, uh, now, so now we've we've um, we've been able to see that uh, we've been able to find blow up for arbitrarily small data for some sigma, like say here or here, um, uh, that are outside the range of the theorem. And so, um, and we're able to get that from um, finding um, basically exact periodic solutions. So we've been able to find exact periodic solutions. Um, by sort of uh, adapting the method that I used on the real line. So these exact periodic solutions involve looking for poles and uh, double and single poles with a periodic form, <laughs> movable singularities. Um, things start to get way more complicated now. In particular, um, when you integrate these things, you get logs, both of them. You get logs, we integrate that, logs, we integrate that. And so we have a velocity, which is an integral of that. So you get the logs. And so you can't get you don't need you can't have logs in these exact solutions. So, um, but the idea occurred that we can combine these two, and to get the logs to cancel out. And so, uh, so that gives you a condition on the amplitudes. And so, when you do that, uh, you get you can get an exact solution. You get closure. You can get a closed system. And so, here's the ODEs. They're more complicated than the simple one I showed before. We can't integrate these exactly. Um, so we do, a, we're, we'll look at it. Here's the, here's the phase plane. So we do a phase plane analysis of blow up. Um, we've, we've, we've mostly done this one. Uh, you can get blow up here, here, and it's, this is symmetric. So you get blow, blow up in certain regions of the phase plane. Uh, and so in any case, and these, some of these solutions uh, will uh, exhibit finite time singularities um, for arbitrarily small data. But the sigma is outside the range of the theorem. So that brings up the question, what is the minimum sigma for global existence? All right. So uh, that's it. Um, I'll conclude just by mentioning some open questions. Uh, so one, one I have is what is the, um, what is the, uh, what is, is there any way we can analyze this critical value where the blow up changes 
born from collapsing to expanding. Um, that came out of the numerics. Um, uh, so I had this line before I got the preprint of De Huang, but basically um, uh, rigorous analysis remains open for any region in which there's global existence. No, nobody has shown global, uh, global existence for large data even. That remains open, so I'll stop there.